Imagine somebody took all of the gems in Spyro and moved them into the most hard to reach places possible. Where would they be? Maybe on top of the portals in the homeworld, or the mountains in the distance. Could be on top of some of the ancient trees of beast makers, or even the soaring castle spires of Lofty and Dreamweavers. This mod is called the Spyro Collectible Shuffler by Pete Guy 100 and Pete went through the entire game meticulously moving every gem by hand to some of the hardest spots that he could even possibly achieve using save states and cheats. But I don't think he anticipated somebody coming along and trying to do the entire game with no cheats, no save states, and one continuous playthrough on console. Well, enter me. I'm just a shirtless man with a dream, and that's to conquer every single gem in this mod and get through without 99 lives, without save stating, but playing it just like I would've when I was a kid. Except now, I ain't no baby ass bitch. I'm a fully grown man. And I'm here with years of game knowledge and speedrunning deadbeat experience in order to conquer, maybe be the only person to ever conquer this challenge. I mean, let's be honest. If anybody is going to bonk on the same wall for hours at a time, running through the level and game overing for a week straight, it's gonna be me. So without further ado, I would like to take you through each level in this mod one by one because really each one had its own stories, challenges, and bullshit possibly taking hours at a time to overcome. And before I get into it, I just want to say thanks for watching. To start, I knew I was going to be in for a long one because all of the gems and dragons were on top of the fucking mountains and artisans. Like, how do you grab that? Well, I decided for now to put that on the back burner and start cleaning up some of the levels to see what was in store for me. Stone Hill was looking pretty unassuming, and you'll see that most of the gems were in their normal position until the very end when I encountered two towers to be conquered. The first tower was easy enough to get on top of. All I had to do was glide from the hill right next to it and bounce off of the collision, gliding again to get finally on top. But the second tower was more of a doozy. You couldn't quite reach it with a glide or a bounce, so what I had to do was wall glide off of the spire in between, going off to the right instead of the left. This took a lot of trial and error and a lot of falling off and having to get onto the first one again. So you could kind of start to see how monotonous of a challenge this is starting to be, and frankly, I didn't know if I had it in me at this point. To add insult to injury, it dawned on me that I didn't have a memory card in, and that this wasn't going to be a single sitting playthrough. So after I got all of those gems in Stonehill, and a few others in Town Square and Dark Hollow, I had to restart my game and get them all again, this time remembering to save. But speaking of Town Square, I found that it wasn't too difficult because of a little trick that the bulls allow you to do. You see their little charging attack where they go like, Arr! It actually extends infinitely upwards, so you could do it as high above them as possible. This allows you to get up to the roofs using careful damage abuses, and even lets you fly out to the mountains. So overall, Town Square, not too tough. But Dark Hollow was going to be another story. Like Stonehill, most of the gems in Dark Hollow were in their normal position, save for a few that you can get to out of bounds behind some of the walls. Nothing too difficult for me. But there was one dragon and box sitting on top of the fucking archway in the middle of the level. That thing is like 50 feet tall. How are you going to get up there? Well, I jumped up to the hills out of bounds and tried gliding to that dragon until the cows came home, but I just could not get close enough. That was until someone in my chat suggested I try jumping from the other side of the hills. I figured there's no way. Those hills are way lower than the ones I was jumping from. It's pretty much impossible. Quit backseating, bitch. But they were right. And it was all because of one new technique that would come to define this playthrough. Scenery proxies. All right, are you ready for some real TAS level shit right now? If you fly back in bounds through a wall with just the right positioning and speed, you'll get bounced way up into the air, making the glide to this dragon and chest easy money. But why does this happen? Well, let me break it down for you. Spyro is not meant to get stuck inside of things that have collision in this game, like enemies, walls, or objects. So the programmers added a failsafe that ejects Spyro out of the wall when he would have otherwise been stuck inside of it. This big flop occurs at the same angle that the polygon is facing in bounds. That means that in order to get flops that actually achieve more height, we need to fly into walls that are angled upwards. 
Not only that, but we have to make sure we don't fly too quickly through the wall or else we don't get a proxy at all. So they're pretty precise to do correctly and I'm just a human. So essentially I gotta just fly into these walls and hope to get lucky with these bounces or proxies as I'll now refer to them. With that, we're finished up with Dark Hollow and ready to take on the Artisan's homeworld now. Remember those gems and dragons on top of the mountains? Well, I had been trying to mess with wall glides and different tech to get up to them in between some of the levels, but I just couldn't get close at all. But now it was do or die, and if I couldn't get these gems, that was pretty much the end of this playthrough. But luckily, I did have Pete in my chat, the creator of this mod, to kind of help give me tips and clues along the ways of how to possibly get some of these gems. But what Pete did here was a scenery proxy off of the Toasty Head, which is why I haven't gone into Toasty yet and unlocked the Dragon Head. But I kept trying it and it just wasn't getting close for me. I found that for me, a wall glide into a possible scenery proxy was probably going to be my best bet. But eventually I did get my wall glide to the one piece of walkable floor on the other side of the mountain there. At this point, it's worth mentioning that not every piece of floor is able to be walked on. Some of it is solid, some of it is invisible, but some of it has a slide off mechanic that forces Spyro into a rolling animation. You can see it here on this mountain, and luckily, as a player, you're able to hold X to continue jumping out of this roll, so that way you don't get slid off. But if you're not ready for that, then you will lose all of your progress at a spot like that and just get rolled off the side of the mountain. Well, I started cleaning everything up on this mountain, but one thing you'll notice is that when I touch a dragon out of bounds that's been moved around, that Spyro will automatically walk around it and thus fall off the side of the mountain. Now, luckily, the way dragons work in this mod is that when you die after collecting a dragon, so long as you haven't touched its original pedestal, you'll respawn back at the point where you touched it. But if you game over, your respawn point will reset and you'll have to get back to that dragon the normal way all over again. Since I'm not using cheat codes here for extra lives, that means I have to farm orbs from enemies I've already defeated. 20 orbs is one life, which is a lot of enemies for just one area in the game. But luckily, you do sometimes get lucky extra lives, and while it is tedious to grind orbs, it adds another layer of strategy to the playthrough, where I'm trying to manage my lives so that way I can respawn on dragons that are hard to reach and basically not have to do a lot of movement over and over again. And so getting back to the game, I ran out of lives cleaning things up in Artisans. I did get most things, but there were a couple of gems that I had yet to clean up. So since I had to do all that movement again anyways, I figured let's go into Toasty and finish that up and, you know, chill. Take a breath of fresh air. Well, a breath of fresh air I could not have in Toasty because I had to relearn the classic Vortex trick, Dog Proxy. This trick involves running up to the first two enemies of the level and having the shepherd hit you at the same time that you get stuck inside of the dog's belly flop animation, thus combining the two effects and proxying you very high, very high into the air. As you can imagine, the timing and positioning of this is very precise as we need both of the enemies to see us at roughly the same time, as well as jumping at the perfect time to get inside of the dog's belly flop. This took me many tries, and eventually I had to refer to a video tutorial in order to use audio and visual cues in order to approach them in the exact perfect way that this proxy would allow. But eventually, I got it, not once, but three different times in order to get to the different areas and roofs and far off, kind of out of bounds spots where all the gems were hidden away. But we did that shit, and all that was left for me at that point were five gems in the Artisan's homeworld. Two on top of the Stone Hill portal, and three on top of the archway outside of the Balloonist. I didn't even realize that those three gems at the end were even there until I already collected all the other ones, so it just goes to show how well hidden some of these gems are, so shoutouts to Pete for being a complete fucker for that one. I mean, thank you, Pete. But regardless, I grinded out a tough glide to hit those Stone Hill gems, and then it was on to those last three little shits. I had to do all the same out of bounds wall glide mountainous movement that I did to get all the other gems, but then I had to get through some invisible polygons in order to fly to those three red gems from behind. But wouldn't you know, I did actually make a glide that could have potentially grabbed them, but as I was playing it safe and slowing down my glide, I got a scenery proxy shooting me right out of the wall, away from my intended trajectory, and just completely leaving me crushed on the inside. 
but I thought, you know what? I've come this far. I am not going to let these three gems defeat me. I flew all the way back up on top of the mountain, and this time, I started flaming some of the ground polygons in order to see which ones had collision and which ones didn't. I was able to set up much more accurately to these red gems and remembered not to slow down when coming back inbounds to get a nice uh, little cleanup despite another unintended scenery proxy. I mean, we made it work. Everything's fine. Let's move on. Three hours deep in Artisans, and we are just getting started. Also, I forgot to mention this, but I did do Sunny Flight, and that was completely normal. All the flight levels are normal. Hey, if you guys are enjoying this playthrough, I just wanted to let you know that I do crazy challenge runs like this pretty much all the time, and when I'm not doing them, I'm doing high-level world record speed runs. So if you're not subscribed to the channel, what the hell are you doing, man? Hit the button and follow some of the streams, man. I'd love to see you in the chat. But with that, it is time to move on to Peacekeepers. Now, Pete did warn me that the levels in Peacekeepers might be the hardest in the entire run. And that scared me because Artisans was not easy, man. But I pressed on and I went into what turned out to be one of the longest odysseys of a level that I ever experienced in this game, Dry Canyon. Upon starting the level and getting my feet wet, I immediately saw a dragon and gems on top of the fucking tunnel. Like, how are you supposed to get there? I immediately started theory crafting with the birds and damage boosting, but I figured, nah, you know, let's just finish the all the other gems and then see what else we have at our disposal. So I cleaned up the rest of the level, came back and fucked with these birds for like, I shit you not, like an hour and a half, or at least that's what it felt like. And then eventually, you know, people trying to give me like ideas and concepts in the chat, like, oh, maybe try it off of this bird or try to double bird which is impossible and try to you know shoot off the guy and there's like so many theories happening at this time but what I ended up deciding was instead of damage boosting off the birds I would try to get all the way around the wall using a very tight wall glide gaining as much height as possible while pause buffering the turn around the corner blind I was gonna counter strike surf over to this dragon and snipe it out of the fucking air and after many attempts, I finally got one that I thought was close, but was just a little bit too far underneath him. But what Whoa! the fuck? <laughs> like, I hit that dragon from like a foot underneath and it still counted. Well, it turns out that's actually how the dragons work when you move them away from their pedestals. They actually stretch a little bit underneath what it looks like. So you can hit them from below, but then death abuse to get up to where they actually are. Now this was going to be very helpful for me on this playthrough as you're going to see, but don't worry, it wasn't really a crutch and it only allowed me to make a couple sections more trivial. There were still a lot of dragons that were just unable to be touched from below, so it doesn't work on every single one, but you take what you can get on a playthrough like this. So after death abusing up to the dragon and cleaning up a couple gems, I was thinking, all right, I'm home free now. This level's easy, la, 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 yada, yada. But unfortunately, I couldn't go anywhere after that because the roof is shaped like the giantest version of the Rook from chess, meaning that even Spyro's fullest full hop and trickiest little edge flops can't even get up there. So I'm basically fucked and have to do the whole bird proxy situation all over again. So after watching a whole nother video, I learned that this is actually a bird damage boost done on the upper section of the level. Now let's talk about damage boosts for a sec. Spyro has a momentum value based on how fast you're moving. And when you bonk into a wall, it actually preserves your momentum for the entirety of the bonk animation. This means that if you charge into a wall, bonk, and then get hit by an enemy like the birds, you can get boosted really high up into the air. And the quicker you get hit after bonking, then the stronger the boost is. But remember that these are horizontal boosts, and in order to get a vertical boost, we need to get bounced off of an upward facing wall, similarly to scenery proxies. So I tussled with the bird again, and this time managed to get up to another dragon with, thankfully, not too much pain or tears. So now I had to make my way all the way back to where I originally grabbed the first dragon. And let me tell you, these roofs were not easy to walk on. I mean, they weren't even roofs at all. It was only just the edge perimeter, like 45 degree angle tip of the mountains that I could walk on. And some of them rolled me off and others were standable and other ones you just couldn't stand on. So it was a big game of trial and error and falling off and death abusing and grinding for more lives. And luckily we didn't have to 
to do too much life grinding in Dry Canyon because Pete found a spot on two cacti where you can actually glide into them and flop indefinitely, which triggers a void out. Interestingly, though it has the same respawn effect as a death, it doesn't cost a life to void out in this game. So eventually, I figure out that you can scenery proxy off one of the weird angled perimeters and get all the way over to one of the roofs and then clean up the rest at the end. And that was Dry Canyon for how many hours was I in there? I mean, this is, I'm just losing track of time and reality at this point. But onward we move to Clifftown, but not before doing a little bit of homeworld exploration and damage boosting off of the cannon guys to get on top of the Clifftown portal, that's a new spot, and then knocking out the uh, flight level and touching on Ice Cavern and Dr. Shemp and just seeing what was in store for me. Notably, there was going to be a fucking annoying wall glide in Ice Cavern that I had to get out of the way, so I fucking head grinded it to the ass and fucking got rid of that thing. I don't even want to think about that green anymore. I'm lucky it didn't take longer. But after all that, I finally got to Clifftown to see another fucking long grind ahead of me. You see, in Clifftown, there were gems on top of the roofs, not just at the start of the level, but at the very end at the ravine as well, where all the birds are. Surely I had more damage boosts in my future with these birds. I mean, they might as well just rename it Damage Keepers, because that's all the fuck I'm doing here is just getting hit over and over by different enemies and dying and grinding for lives and trying to void out and trying not to go crazy. And I've been in this homeworld already for like four or five hours. It's okay. It's okay. We got this. I get a lucky boost early on to get on one of the roofs, but then the second one, the one near the start, that one gave me a lot of trouble, and I had to end up taking Laura's advice of jumping on top of a tiny spike by the force field. Like, it's like a millimeter thick, but just stand on the smallest, hard to reach triangle you possibly can in the whole level, and then hit a tight glide from there. Easy. Well, my troubles weren't even over at that point because I didn't even realize there were extra gems hiding at the very end of the level by the vortex behind the roofs requiring another shitty wall glide. I mean, like, your boy just can't get any breaks here, but we do eventually, after banging our head at it multiple times and running through, we eventually get through Clifftown, and then we're on to what actually turned out to be the true final boss of Peacekeepers, and that would be and that would be, um, what is it, Dr. Shemp. Now, I actually underestimated Dr. Shemp because when I went through the level for the initial gems, I saw that all I would really need to do is a damage boost like they do in Vortex to get to some of the gems that were higher up. But on top of this damage abuse being frame perfect, it also required that I got additional height from the mountain to the right of me in order to get onto the roof where the dragon was. Now, I had a couple options with this mountain that I didn't really find any success with. You could scenery proxy to the left of it, but usually that would send you into the Vortex or you could try to flop along the top of it to try to mash X all the way over to the dragon and get that glide out and just get lucky. But on one miraculous attempt, I think God himself smiled upon me because I got a damage abuse that was not enough, flew underneath to the right, and then somehow scenery proxied upwards from underneath continuously. Like, this is shit that you'll only see in the silly percent task. I'm not even kidding. And then made it up to the dragon. Like, how? How did I do that? <laughs> like, some things will just forever be a mystery to me in this game. Anyways, after getting done with all of the damage abusing and gem cleanup, I finished up the final wall glide to get the final two gems of the level and then got my ass out of there and cleaned up peacekeepers and called it a goddamn day. We are two homeworlds done and only four more to go, dude. This is going to take forever, man. But you guys know me. I'm holding my head high and we're on to magic crafters. Now, at this point, I was basically hoping and pleading that the gem placements would start to get a little bit easier from this point forward. Well, they didn't. Enter Alpine Ridge. Now, take a moment and think about how long I spent in some of these levels so far. Maybe an hour and a half, two, three hours even? 
Well, try five and a half hours of mindless grinding in Alpine Ridge. And for no small reason either, Pete managed to put gems on three archways that proved to be more difficult than any other spot in the entire level to reach, each one requiring its own unique set of skills and fuckery. Archway number one required me to goad the big yellow enemy into walking towards me and then squeezing me back into the archway in order to squeeze on top of. That alone took a couple hours. Now the second archway, I basically had no idea what to fucking do. So I put the second archway on the back burner, you know, knocked out that first one best I could. I mean, I barely squeaked by by the hair of my balls on that one, but Archway number three was actually kind of an interesting one because that one required me to actually run up an otherwise unwalkable surface in order to jump perfectly out of bounds and then scenery proxy to two different dragons, allowing me to do the whole respawn and then jump to the second dragon type thing. So archways number one and three were pretty unique, pretty different and pretty odd, but it was that second archway that I spent the majority of my time in this level. And what ended up happening was I learned maybe three different possible ways that it could be done. And let me just explain what each of those are real quick. Firstly, there was the possibility for two different wall glides, one from the secret area to the left and another one from the final area by the vortex to the right. Now, I had more luck with the wall glide to the right, but I still couldn't find a way after many attempts to get enough height at the very end to hit the bottom of the dragon. It just wasn't angled correctly for me to hit it from underneath like I did in Dry Canyon. And then frustratingly, there's a spot that you could actually roll jump on top of all of the mountains, but you can't glide out of a roll jump. Like if I could just glide out of that rolling animation quickly at the top of my jump, then it would be fine. I could have reached that dragon like it was nothing. But of course, you can't do that. So I had to find out a different way. Well, the second way to do it is like in the silly percent task where you get bounced off of the edge of a moving wall controlled by the druid underneath. Well, of course I'm trying this over and over, but it's very precise. And even if I go a little bit too far forward into the cave, the druid goes like wah, wah. And that's a failed attempt. If I'm too far early, too far back, then I die. That's a failed attempt. And even when I do get the bounce, it'll usually just send me straight into the roof, and that's a failed attempt. So each one of these is a loss to life, causing me to have to run through the level again, and then game over, causing me to have to run through the entire home world again. And you can see how monotonous and mind-numbing this has become. But I stayed strong and kept at it like the little trooper I am. And Pete came in and gave me some very valuable knowledge. That is, there is a third way of getting to these items, which is what he did, going on a wall glide to the right of the vortex and landing on the other archway that's on the other side of that tunnel. So by doing that and then jumping around, all of this is very precise movement, you can then do a scenery proxy inside of this archway in order to reach back to that final second archway where my last two collectibles were. Now by this point, I'm losing my mind and my internet is shitting itself, so I am putting on a PowerPoint presentation performance of one of the craziest scenery proxies I've ever achieved in my life, finally getting to the last two collectibles of the level, popping off harder than I ever did for any goddamn world record speed run, and calling it a day in Alpine Ridge. Good lord. Break time. Well, I took a well-deserved rest, and after fucking around in the home world with a really cool boost that let me get on top of a few mountain gems, it was time to finally move on to high caves, where, of course, my problems would just continue. After cleaning up the basic gems in high caves, I knew that I was going to have to get on top of the roof for a couple of gems that I could clearly see from below, but there was actually a lot more that was hidden there than I even realized, and once I did this ancient awesome supercharge to jump on top of the roof, I realized that my problems were only kind of just beginning. That's because most of the polygons on this roof are either unwalkable or you just fall straight through them. So you gotta be holding X the entire time in case you get one of those roll slip 
polygons as well. So it's definitely confusing and I spent a lot of time just kind of falling through the roof by accident being like, okay, can't stand there. And then going back around and taking forever on the supercharge. By the way, getting that supercharge all the way on the roof is kind of awkward because it happens most easily when you have less speed rather than more. But uh, finding the right balance of speed in order to get this supercharge and not get fucked was a real challenge and it took a lot of time in the level just getting on the roof and getting to some of these gems. But by the very end, I thought I had gotten them all and of course there was two more on the mountain behind the roof that you could like barely see so had to go back for those but yeah after all that fuckery that was high caves complete. Now it was time for Wizard Peak, and thankfully there was only one difficult spot that I needed to get to, but it was on top of an archway that required more difficult supercharge jumping. Well, I managed to get lucky and get one of these gems on top of the archway, but all I had to do was just grab the dragon after and I was done. It was an easy jump, easy glide, and what do I do? I run off the side and miss it. So the recovery, I don't know if that got in my head or something, but the recovery took me forever. Like, I don't even know how long just going back up and down these supercharged ramps manually, trying not to waste lives, adjusting my speed, trying to get the perfect bump and grind off of the wall while I'm supercharging and turning it back. I mean, it turned into a very needless odyssey of a recovery, but I did eventually get the dragon without falling off this time, and that was Wizard Peak done. Oof. So now I'm basically halfway through the playthrough and I'm starting to feel hope and maybe a little sense of insanity that maybe I can actually beat this and finish it because the amount of difficulty that all of these levels presented to me showed me that maybe I am just gonna get stuck and I might take four, five, six hours and not even complete a level, but the determination to even get this far I think was pretty admirable even if the playthrough were to die right now. So if you appreciate this level of determination to a Spyro playthrough, please leave a like down below. I mean, hook me up with some love, leave a comment, but let's get to the final level of Magic Crafters, and that is going to be Blowhard. Now, thankfully, Blowhard was not too difficult. There was just a few gems out of bounds near the start that I could use a damage boost from one of the wizards to actually hit the dragon from underneath, giving me a little bit of leniency there, which was much appreciated after all of the struggle up to this point. And so I carefully went around the rim of this little spire to collect every little gem without falling and showed off a cool little spot you could stand on as a little bonus before getting out of Blowhard and finishing off Magic Crafters, heading on over to Beast Makers. And what better way to kick off the start of Beast Makers than to have possibly the hardest level in the entire mod so far, Terrace Village. Now, Terrace Village was actually insane because there were gems put on the roofs in the first half of the level, which are not normally supposed to be accessed by the player. In order to get up to these roofs, I had three different options. One, do something called Biscuit Blast, which is a damage abuse frame perfect off of one of the metal guys to get shot up into the air. Two, do a flop off of one of the rockets that shoots the fireworks. Make sure you don't collect those gems so you can keep death abusing and keep trying to glide perfectly to get knocked by one of those rockets as it shoots off. Or three, do a damage abuse from this purple guy right here to barely get high enough for one of the dragons. Well, as it turned out, that last damage abuse right there ended up being my key to the success of this level because after fucking around with it for hours, I eventually figured out that I could go from that shorter part of the roof where I land and flop off of an edge to get up to the dragon. I mean, that was such a breakthrough when I did that, but I wasn't even done with the madness at that point. After cleaning up all the gems in that roof, I then realized that there were four gems left, three on a shelf and one on another shelf that was inaccessible from inbounds. That means that in order to get these gems, I had to, without a doubt, do the firework or the biscuit blast. And eventually, I ended up getting a blast that got me to those three gems, but not the fucking out of bounds gem. Nope, had to get a fucking flop and then jump again weirdly out of bounds over the wall with another difficult flop off of a glide and pray to God
god that I don't get scenery proxied back in bounds and charge into the fucking gem at the perfect height so that I wasn't too high or too low to get stuck. And god damn it, I got it on the first first try that I got out of bounds there. But it was such an odyssey of trying to bounce off these rockets and trying to get hit by this enemy and trying to get hit by that enemy and constantly life grinding, running through the level, killing every enemy to try to get orbs and lives just to help stop the game overs, just stop the bleed just a little bit. By far, this was the hardest I had life grinded and the hardest I had actually grinded damage abuses and weird out of boundsy tricks in the entire run. And I was honestly so proud of myself to complete this level. Terrace Village was a fucker. Now, thankfully, things are starting to get a little bit easier, but not any less weird, because in the Beastmaker's homeworld, I had to do one of the oddest tricks that's even known in Spyro called level disassociation. You see, when Spyro touches a portal, the level doesn't load until the camera touches the portal after. This means that if you roll into the portal the exact right way and get the camera stuck, Spyro will be gliding indefinitely until he voids out. Once you respawn from that void, then Spyro's going to be invincible because the game thinks he's still trying to enter the portal. Pretty neat little invincibility trick to run on the water in the Beastmaker's homeworld, but even then, I still couldn't reach some of the gems on top of these logs. And that's where the dragon hover comes in. Yeah, that's right, hovering off of one of the dragons you collect. Are you guys following with this shit? This is just insane to me. If you collect a dragon, then trigger level dissociation, you'll respawn at that point where you touch the dragon a little bit higher than the time before. So if you keep repeating the process, you'll gain massive amounts of height. Where the fuck, am dude, literally where am I? until you game over and have to restart the process. For this reason, I needed to grind out at least like five to seven lives in order to reach some of these really far out glides to these out of bounds logs that had gems placed on them precariously, getting on top of the roofs and the big pyramid structure in the middle of Beast Makers. We did all of that using level dissociation and dragon hovering. And I honestly did not ever think that there would be a use for these glitches ever in this game, but Pete, had to go and prove me wrong. I mean, this is just insanity. And during this whole process, I decided to knock out Misty Bog, which of course had a dragon on top of the tallest archway in the entire fucking game at the start. But of course, reaching the top of this archway would be trivial as long as you could do shrub proxy. It's just a frame perfect flame at the exact moment the shrub eats you while you're gliding, forcing you to do a preemptive jump, anticipating its movement. Just be inside the shrub's head. It's so easy. Can you tell I'm just completely numb to this shit now? Like, oh, do this frame perfect thing here. Get this insane proxy that's only really done in tasses. Do this crazy glitch that's not useful anywhere else except for in this mod. I'm here for it. So it was onward and upward to treetops where thankfully things got a little easier. All I had to do was do a crazy supercharged turnaround to land inside of the huts by the dragon. Of course, you know, there's no collision on their roof so you could just go over them so long as you have enough speed. But you know, that took many, many tries and all that was left at that point was getting the last two gems on top of the little exit tunnel when you take the final supercharge through the level. I was coming up with all sorts of weird ways to do it, but as it turned out, the easiest and most straightforward way of just getting a bunch of speed and jumping off the main ramp was the ticket to success. So treetops actually wasn't as bad as people were expecting, but if you struggled in that level as a kid, leave a comment down below. I want to hear about that. But finally, it was time for the last level of Beast Makers, Metalhead. And of course, Pete would hide a bunch of gems in hard to reach places. Let's see what happened. Dude, oh my God, stop. Oh yeah, that does work. Oh my God, fuck. He turned me the wrong way though. Fuck, I had that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got a first try chicken proxy right into a first try flop, a bowling attempt at one of the little metal monkey guys, landing me straight on the roof, cleaning up all of the difficult to grab gems, basically first try. I mean, I could have spent like hours here trying to do this, but I guess at this point I had just ascended to like task levels of fuckery and execution and I'm not going to question it. I'm going to thank my lucky stars and move on to Dreamweavers. Weavers. 
I couldn't help myself. I had to knock out Haunted Towers before I was done that day. And man, were there some crazy supercharges and wizard proxies that had to be done in order to reach some of the jagged roofs at the start and at the end of the level. But we got all of those except for just a couple of gems right by the very start above you. So what do I do? I came up with some ingenious idea that I had never tried before, mimicking the damage boost from Magic Crafters. I actually did that off of one of the wizards there in the start of Haunted Towers with as much speed as possible, shooting way off to the moon and landing perfectly on those last few gems. Haunted Towers was actually a really fun level to clean up. And by this point, I was actually starting to get really excited. Like, oh my God, guys, I think I might actually beat this mod. It's very rare that I spend this many hours on a single playthrough of Spyro, not knowing if it can even be finished or not. So at this point, my spirits are high and we're on to the Dreamweaver's homeworld cleanup. Now, there were some really fucked up gems over on top of the jock portal area, really jagged stalactites jutting out from the ground pretty high up. My only real hope was to do a flop off of these changing heights of the little guys. You know those little three dudes in a row that always fucking hit you every time? Well, yeah, now I was going to get hit and knocked off the edge by them over and over until I got the perfect flop, which of course I eventually did, but then failed the jump after. So after multiple near make attempts, I finally got up and got those gems there in the home world, cleaning it up for good and moving on to Dark Passage. Now, I got lucky in Dark Passage because the only things out of the way were four dragons sitting on top of shelves that were easy enough to grab using damage boosts from the little Cupid guys. So, pretty trivial, pretty easy level, on to Lofty, where this is where shit really goes off the rails. And this level was just so much fun because in this level, you can do the highest damage boost in the entire game. And I'm talking about these 100, 200 foot castles, twice the height of that. Just by using supercharge, getting orange speed, and crashing into this wall, the arrow from that same Cupid enemy that helped me in Dark Passage, well now it shoots you way up into the air with the conserve momentum, and so I used that to my advantage to clean up all the rest of the gems in Lofty. That was actually a really fun time, especially trying to jump between some of the roofs and getting fucked up by like the collision and just knowing I could just do the supercharge again. It was starting to get really fun at this point. But that fun would soon come to an end as I entered Jock. In this level, I could see right away that there were gems in places that I simply had no idea how to get up to. Like, in Tasses, I've seen them bounce off of this little jester guy, but there was no way I was going to do that as a player, right? Well, I tried. <laughs> and rest assured, I pretty much couldn't do it. I found some cool little flops and things that might have gotten me close, but I realized that my only way of getting to these upper areas of the level along the mountains and above the waterfall were going to be to wall glide from the other side of the level where the jock fight occurs. But even still, after doing a couple of clutch wall glides, I realized that I wasn't going to get back all the way towards the starting area. So at that point, Pete popped in my chat. Thank God he came to the rescue and told me that if you stand on the edge of this platform right here, that the jock fight does not continue and thus the one platform stays high up for you to jump off of so that was a huge breakthrough for me and once i realized that you could get back to the starting area and kind of do some weird finagly little glides then basically the level got opened up to me at that point and i just tried my best not to waste my lives and to try to make some of these tight glides from around the mountains out of bound in front of them behind them mashing x to get in between little ridges and things like that the level actually got pretty fun by the end and i even just a really weird void out along the way so got the key grabbed the gems finished up jock did take a while but we overcame it and now we were on the final home stretch everybody nasty's home world <laughs> I actually took a sneak peek at Nasty's world in the beginning just to make sure it was completable because in this home world, there are situations where you may not even be able to continue your run. So imagine I'm 20 hours in and then I soft lock myself out of getting one of the dragons, which by the way, were hidden 
not in the dragon mouths, like, you know, where the boxes are, but like in their jaw area, like underneath the mouth. So that means that I had to be very careful about how I opened or closed the heads, because once I opened them, there was no closing them again, and that changes their geometry permanently. So basically, I was forced to do a trick called early loot to get... <laughs> This is insane. I had to get into Nasty's head, fly underneath into his jaw, get pushed under the stage, charge jump out, fly under the stage, take damage on the water, and then land underneath both the loot portal and the Twilight Harbor portal to get the dragon and the gems that were there. But thank God, after plenty of attempts, and keep in mind, you have to do rat proxy or some cobalist method just to even attempt either of those early loot or twilight methods. I mean, like, it's just layers on layers of precise, lucky movement. I mean, it's just crazy that this kind of movement is even possible in the game. So I left the last two gems in Nasty's world inside of the smokestacks right there, thinking, oh, it'll be no big deal. I could just do rat proxy for those later. Let's knock out Nork Cove. So just remember those two gems for later, because they're actually going to be the secret final boss of the run. Well, anyways, I got into Nork Cove and this level was kind of unique because they put some gems way off in the water, kind of similar to Beastmaker's homeworld where they put the gems in like weird little props out in the water that required me to do a lot of a trick called T and teamwork on big enemies that slap you up using their big TNT crate. But luckily the leniency for these tricks is pretty, pretty lenient. So I was able to get away with T and teamwork and do some tight wall glides, mess around on the mountain and kind of come up with some of my own strats to really clean up that level without too much pain and struggle and um yeah that was basically nork cove a lot of teamwork with me and the big fat tnt guys i mean name a better duo than shirtless man and tnt man you get sparks in there and that's like a nightmare blunt rotation <laughs> So anyways, we get back into the home world and I think, let me clean up those last two gems I was thinking of before going into Twilight Harbor. <laughs> Quick, right? No problem. One hour later. I mean, these gems wouldn't be so hard on their own if I could just land on the smokestack right there, which technically you can, but it's such a tight corner for you to stand on that the gems being inside the smokestack mean that you have to fully rub up against it while standing there in order to actually collect them. And before you suggest it, I tried dropping into the smokestacks from above and they're barely too narrow for Spyro to fit his fat ass inside of. So I I had to quit doing rat proxy and resort to finally figuring out how to do the bridge proxy. And I had to do that on both sides over and over and over, perfectly charging into the post next to the dock, letting go of square at the exact right second and somehow getting launched up into the air from that, then charging and landing perfectly on the edge and rubbing up against the side of the smokestack just enough to collect each gem. It was probably one of the most precise execution based moments of the entire run grabbing those two gems, believe it or not. But when I got them, I was ecstatic and Sarah was there to celebrate with me. So onward and upward to Twilight Harbor. This is the final stretch, everybody. I need this hype now. I have completely lost all sense of reality over these last 25 hours. And I'm just wondering how much is left in store for me. And can I still even beat this? I'm still kind of wondering in my head. Like Twilight is no easy level. And as you're gonna see here, getting into this, there are some fucked up places that Pete put these gems. The first spot in Twilight that was really crazy was on top of a little vent that drops out lava way off on a peninsula around the other side of the supercharge ramp. Like, why did the devs even put that there? I don't know. But I had to basically become an expert on supercharge momentum abuse, figuring out that through the help of people in my chat, like Luminescent Sky, that I could glide above the supercharge ramp and charge from even higher to get more and more speed, allowing me to finally get enough height to fly over to that area, but not before hitting a couple of lucky scenery proxies on top of that, and finally touching the dragon on top. And so that took me quite a while, but the gems that were even harder than that were near the beginning. Like, look at these things. How the fuck are you supposed to get up there? I can't like use an enemy to get up. I can't use any scenery proxies. 
I have to like figure out some crazy shit. Well, as it turns out, Pete kind of helped me along here. What you have to do is go all the way around every roof, fly on top of them using supercharge, glide across each one, which those are not easy glides to hit, by the way, and then jump in between the third smokestack in order to get stuck inside of it and then jump through the collision, getting clipped through, which is a very rare occurrence in Spiral 1 where collision clips you through. And then from there, you doing a blind jump to land finally on that shelf where the gems are. That trick took so many tries and so many failed attempts and weird ways of figuring out how to get the clip and falling off the roofs and dying and game overing. I mean, dude, like, of course they had to make Twilight like one of the shittiest levels. Like, of course, of course, Pete, you know, like I, I expect no less. I mean, they, he really challenged me as much as he could here on this entire mod but after plenty of time fucking around with that we eventually cleaned it up and it was time for the final boss nasty nork And thankfully, Nasty only had one part that was hard to get to that was on top of these little pipes right here. I'm not really sure what Pete intended, but I did like probably one of the clutchest jumps off of this edge here to reach it and barely land on the pipes. I was so stoked when I landed on those pipes, by the way. I was like popping off. Yes! And then barely jumping to each gem right there before killing the final boss. Now, as you guys know, the run isn't over yet. It's called 120% for a reason. That's because you get a secret level after beating Nasty Nork and watching the credits, you get to see Nasty's loot, the beautiful green lime colored legendary place where dreams are made and lost. I went in with my head held high and I fucking sent it. I fucking cleaned that shit up like it was nothing. And there were even boxes hiding inside of the level there for some reason. I think you were meant to fly out of bounds and kind of grab them from underneath, which I showcased at the end, but I was able to just kind of slide along the side of the wall from inbounds and grab them. All the other gems were normal, and at this point, I was so relieved. It had been 29 hours of gaming and fucking around, but I finally got to the end of loot, 120%. I collected every gem and dragon that a Spyro Tasser could have possibly put to fuck me up or cause me to quit, that he needed safe states and cheats and everything just to get the gems into these places to verify that they're collectible, but I was the only person in history to finally beat the game with no cheat codes, no save states, and no brain, no sanity, but a hell of a sense of accomplishment. So I was stoked and I think my chat was as well. If you guys enjoyed this playthrough and this little story, feel free, like I said, to subscribe down below. I would love to do more challenge runs like this in the future. Hopefully there's gonna be more challenging mods like this. As many of you guys know, there's a Spyro 3.5 and other things, but for now, I'm gonna rest easy. I'm gonna chill until my next insanity appointment. And I just wanna say thank you so much if you watched all the way to the end of this video. It really means a lot to me that you're here. And have a beautiful life. Don't attempt this mod, but if you're curious, you can download it down below and change the settings to make things easier. I've also linked all of the VODs from the entire playthrough there as well. But until next time, guys, my name is Deo. I will catch you in the next one.